So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Uh, today is our second research update and community conversation this year. Um, we are hosting this series of conversations to mark the one year anniversary of um, IMALS's first round of research grants. And we thought that this would be a good way to, to communicate with you progress in research and, and thought of this format for two main reasons. One is to ensure that we um, as an organization are, are held accountable for how we are spending the valuable uh, research dollars that uh, most of which came from unsolicited donations from the community. Um, so this is how we've chosen to, to spend money that comes to us from the community is in, in um, advancing the research for ALS. Um, and secondly, to allow our awardees uh, a chance to update you all on research progress, to give you a chance to ask questions and have a, a, like a smaller group kind of discussion around this research project or other research projects potentially in the ALS field. Um, I just wanna make a note that we are recording this event um, so uh, that we can, so we can share it a little more broadly with the community uh, for those who weren't able to join us in, in real time. Um, so again, today we are delighted to welcome Dr. Albert Laspada. Uh, Dr. Laspada is a, a physician scientist at the University of California, Irvine, where he is a distinguished professor of neurology, biochemistry, and pathology, and is also the associate dean for the School of Medicine. His research is focused on the molecular events that underline neuro, neuron cell death in neurodegenerative diseases, including ALS. Um, I will let him give you the details on, on the work that he's doing in a moment, but first I'm going to try to figure out how to share a video, um, the promotional video that we, that we put together um, when the grant was awarded. Um, Emily, do I just share a screen? Does that how, is that how this works? Yeah. Share screen. Share screen and just make sure it shares original sound. Um, okay, share, or, sound. Got it. share sound. Yeah, share computer sound. Okay. Um, I am having a hard time. I can jump in if you need. Yeah, Emily, I'm gonna I'm gonna send this to you because it's I'm I'm not seeing like the specific window that I can um, share. And let's see if you can maybe you can do it. It's on also on YouTube, so people can watch it on their own time. I'm not hearing sound, or I didn't when it came on. Working on it. Let's see. Share computer sound. There we go. Um, Megan, if you could give me a thumbs up if you can hear this when I start it. Hold up. Before we get into this grant, here's what already happened. KD3010, a potential drug therapy, was tested in animal models for Huntington's disease. In this case, it proved it was safe and effective for Huntington's. KD3010 also has already been approved by the FDA for testing in human patients. Rock on. But isn't IMALS about ending ALS? Yes, and the good news is that Huntington's disease and ALS have shared pathways as neurodegenerative diseases. Neurodegenerative diseases means the cells in your brain or other nerves in your body, neurons, start acting out. For Huntington's disease, KD3010 has shown in animal models to prevent the cells from dying, neurodegeneration. It has shown it promotes lifespan extension and it has shown it rescues function. Meaning, instead of losing function in, say, your hand, it has shown that it actually reverses that loss to regain function back. Reminder, if something is effective for Huntington's disease, it could mean it's effective for ALS. But no one has tested it in ALS. That's where we come in. So, 
IMALS is funding this grant to see if the compound will slow or stop the progression of ALS. Disclaimer, this will likely not cure ALS, but it could help people living with ALS. Here's what IMALS is funding as part of this $200,000 research grant. Number one, Dr. Albert Laspada and his team at UCI Institute for Neurotherapeutics will insert the KD3010 compound into two animal models with an ALS mutation. One will have the ALS mutation TDP43. The other will have another ALS mutation, C9ORF72, G4C2. Second, Dr. Laspada and his team are making neurons from stem cells of patients with ALS with the mutation TDP43. These will be treated in a Petri dish with the KD3010 compound, and the different cell functions will be measured. If, and only if, the results are good, the next step is to try this KD3010 compound against ALS in humans. Whether you're building Okay, thank you, Emily. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll pass it over. Um, but I just wanted to note that if uh, I think that doc, Dr. Lespada's presentation will be about 30 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end, but as questions arise. Here's, um, what was the last Friday? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> I think that was an, uh, an accidental unmute. Um, uh, yeah, if, if you have questions or, or comments throughout, please feel free to raise a hand, uh, like using either the Zoom function or in real life, turn on your camera, put something in the chat, whatever whatever you prefer to do to get our attention, and we'd be happy to take them throughout. So um, without further ado, Dr. Lasada, take it away. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for attending today. So yeah, what I've uh, what I'm going to do in my presentation is I'm going to start by providing a bit of a, of, a, of an overview and rationale, and I had forgotten how good that um, video was from last year. It did cover a, a lot of the things that I'm going to discuss, um, but I think it's fine to see you know the scientific data in, in greater sort of detail, um, and then I'm simply going to you know update you guys on where how the work has progressed with the mouse models. Um, and there's a little wrinkle that we've added to the study, uh, which I think is important because it speaks to the potential translatability uh, of this into human patients. <clears throat> um, and, uh, you know, and as Megan uh, just stated, feel free to stop me with questions. I think you can put them in the chat and Megan will be monitoring them and she'll just, you know, interrupt me if I don't see it because I'll be sharing my screen now and trying to do this PowerPoint presentation. Let's see how this goes. Put it into slideshow. Okay. Now, everyone can see that, I assume. Okay. Okie dokie. So I thought I would start out by telling you a little bit about PPARS. So one thing I should mention at the outset is that, um, you know, this research sort of represents um, you know, uh, the continuation of a project that started in my lab about 15 years ago. So there's a long history here. But I thought one of the most useful things to begin with would be to tell you about the PPARs. Now, as you understand from that introduction, perhaps, um, and from the title, you know, we're interested in PPAR Delta. Um, so PPARs, there's three of them, um, are what are called uh, nuclear receptors. And what they do is they bind a specific ligand and that ligand activates them. So the ligand and then the bound receptor go into the nucleus. And then what they do is they affect the expression of target genes. And by um, effect, affecting the expression of target genes, they yield a physiological effect. Now the PPARs were really discovered about 40 years ago and they became the darling of the pharmaceutical industry because the PPARs were found to regulate metabolic processes. And PPAR gamma is highly expressed in fat cells and was thought to be very important um, for regulating blood sugar. So it became a target for a treatment for diabetes. PPAR alpha is in the liver and was also targeted. Um, and uh, PPAR delta uh, was also targeted um, and is expressed in muscle. 
So the early sort of um, work, and there was a lot of work done by many large pharmaceutical companies, was geared toward identifying you know, drugs to activate these different um, you know, proteins. And PPAR delta, as I said, uh, was studied with the idea it's highly expressed in muscle. So we came to realize that PPAR delta is also highly expressed in neurons and in the brain. And in fact, uh -oh, that's weird. Huh. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, you know, and so again, this is hard to sort of perhaps see, but. Uh, you know, or understand the magnitude of it, but um, this is a very high level of expression. Anything over one is a high level of expression. So PPAR delta is expressed in the brain and the spinal cord, in neurons very highly, but in many other types of cells in the central nervous system. And so um, for that reason, we became interested in seeing if um, we could develop a therapy. And as the video pointed out initially to treat Huntington's disease, and so we were looking for compounds that would potently and selectively agonate, agonize PPAR delta function. Um, two of my colleagues had worked for a company, Calypsis, and they had discovered a drug to target PPAR delta. And the drug has this long chemical name, um, which we won't pronounce, but became known as KD3010. And it was published almost 10 years ago to be a very effective drug to activate PPAR delta. And it was so effective that they took the drug into humans uh, to see if it could be a treatment for diabetes and metabolic syndrome. And it was shown to be safe and it was well tolerated and it worked pretty well in humans. So the idea that we had uh, about, um, well, now it's about, I guess, uh, um, nine years ago was to repurpose this drug as a treatment for Huntington's disease. And so what we did is we did a preclinical trial where we took Huntington's disease mice and we treated them with this drug or we treated them with vehicle. And this neurological dysfunction score, the higher the score, the worse the mice are. And you can see an improvement on the rotating rod, which is a motor coordination task. The longer you can stay, it's like a rotating log that they have to stay on. Um, the longer they can stay on, the better. Um, so, you know, you can see that there was uh, an improvement um, and um, in terms of neurodegeneration, they lost less neurons. And most importantly, they had a significant extension lifespan. Um, the mice usually died when they were about 16 to 20 weeks of age, and they started living to 20 to 24 weeks of age. So that was like a 16% increase in lifespan. And we also did a study where we made um, neurons um, from stem cells from Huntington's disease patients. And we looked to see if um, this compound could prevent against cell death. It's 6475. Um, and you could see it was very um, potent. So this was really very encouraging. And then we went on to try and understand how this drug works. And what we found is this is a very complicated slide. I apologize. But what we did is we took neurons from mice with Huntington's disease. And this is a metabolic assay where we're measuring how well energy production occurs. And to use energy, you have to consume oxygen. And you can see that the Huntington neurons don't consume oxygen so well. But if you treat them with KD3010, the oxygen consumption goes up. And you can see this here, basal oxygen consumption and maximal. You can see that it's reduced. But if you treat with KD3010, um, it's increased. So this is sort of the, the rationale for, for why we sort of decided to you know, to study PPAR delta um, agonists as a treatment for ALS. And we did some work in an in vitro model that I think is really important. So one form of ALS is caused by a, a expansion of, of a C4, C, it's, a, it's a repeat expansion in the C9 ORF72 gene that causes ALS. And in that um, disease, you get um, production of a peptide a dipeptide that is toxic. And the toxicity elicits a change in the um, nucleolus, which is the structure in the nucleus. So again, I don't want to go into the gory details, but suffice it to say that this is a readout of ALS toxicity that we use in a cell culture model. And what we did is we treated with um, a PPAR delta agonist, and you can see the mislocalization abnormality you know, was rescued by the PPAR delta agonist. 
So that suggests that relevance to one sort of aspect of ALS um, neuropathology. And so this is what we presented to um, the IMALS uh, group uh, when we uh, you know, um, submitted our proposal and we were funded to do a study. And the goal of the study was to test the PPAR delta agonist in um, in ALS mice. So the first thing we wanted to do was we wanted to make sure that the dose was going to be optimal. Um, so what we did is we came up with uh, a series of experiments where we tested different concentrations of drug um, to see if um, we could achieve uh, an, an, a beneficial effect. The reason why we did this is in our Huntington's disease study, we had only treated the mice for a short period of time um, for on the order of three months. But in this study, we plan to treat the mice for you know, almost nine months. So we wanted to make sure the drug was optimally safe and effective. So we follow body weight to see if there's any signs of toxicity and the body weight remains stable. And then what we also do is we study to see that the drug is having the expected effect. It's, and what we do is what's called a pharmacodynamic study where we treat mice with the drug. Um, then we dissect out, in this case, the cortex. In the next slide, I'll show you the spinal cord. And you know that PPAR delta is working because there are these target genes whose expression it increases. And with the drug treatment, you can see um, that we saw significant increases at both the 50 milligram per kilogram and 30 milligram per kilogram dose. And so that was important. And this was also the case for the spinal cord. When we treated mice with the drug, we saw the expected biological effect in the brains and the spinal cords of the mice. So this was an important sort of validation step that we needed to go through before we launched the study. And so we also um, looked we tried this really high dose, but we saw that that dose really wasn't well tolerated. The mice became sick. So we decided that 90 milligrams per kilogram was too high a dose. So we decided to go with the 30 milligrams per kilogram because it was safe and effective. And then we started to do injections into the mice every other day. And for this first um, study, we're using the G4C2190 149R mice. And again, these are mice that model the C9 or 72 familial ALS and show features of sporadic ALS. So this is believed to be, uh, you know, one of the best models that are available, you know, for uh, testing um, therapies for ALS that we currently have in the field. Um, and again, what we do is we make sure that the mice are doing well in terms of uh, any sign of the drug causing side effects. And we saw that um, basically, you know, the, the body weight was, was stable. So the mice weighed a little bit less here, but this is, but we didn't see the body weight declining. So this was satisfactory. And then what we did is, um, so this study is underway. And the mice, we started treating them when they were about three months of age. We're going to follow them until they're about a year old. And then when they're six months of age, so that's three months after initiating the study, we start to study, uh, we, we start to analyze, you know, how they're doing in terms of their motor function. And we do a variety of different tests. So one test, again, is this rotating rod. Again, it's like a rolling log. They have to balance themselves on. And, um, you know, basically what we're looking to see if there's any you know, improvement, and there's a slight suggestion that the male mice are doing a little bit better, um, you know, at, at the three-month time point, which is still very early. Um, and uh, we also uh, measure the, uh, the muscle strength. And the way we do this is we measure grip strength of the forelimbs and all four limbs of the mice. And as you can see here, we really didn't see much of a, a change. This is only at three months after the initiation of the treatment. And we also have this neurological physical exam that we do on the mice where we see how they bound themselves on a lead, ledge. We see if they have a clasping defect, which is abnormal. We monitor their gait and we look for signs of weakness in their back where their um, back would like bow um, and get what's called kyphosis. And we rate that on a scale. Each of these is rated on a scale of zero to three. So normal is zero and like horribly sick is 12. 
Um, and we sort of did this, all this work, I should say, is done in a blinded fashion where the people who work for me don't know, you know, which are the mice that received drug, which didn't receive drug. And the two R mice are, are control mice that don't get sick that we use as a basis of comparison. And, um, you know, basically at this early point in, in the, in the preclinical trial, we did not see any change. Um, also want to point out that with this particular C9, C9 or 72 mouse model, there is um, TDP43 accumulation. That's why it's relevant to the, uh, to the sporadic ALS. And in addition to these mice, um, you know, developing motor neuron disease, they also develop sometimes uh, some phenotypes of hyperactivity and anxiety. Um, and so these are things that we also are assaying for. And so we use what's called an open field and we simply monitor, you know, how much the mice have, you know, walked around um, over a, a given period of time, um, the distance traveled. And so we've done this and, uh, you know, we allow them to explore for 15 minutes and we didn't see any evidence of, uh, of really hyperactivity at this stage. Um, again, the mice are still pretty young. And now at eight months, we did start to see evidence of hyperactivity. And we noted that for male mice, there was a trend toward reduced activity in the mice that were being treated with the drug. Um, so again, something that, you know, is, is early on. And another thing that we do to study anxiety, um, this, uh, I hope you're not eating your breakfast or lunch now, but uh, when mice are anxious, um, they will uh, have uh, an increased uh, um, uh, fecal activity. And so you can count the number of, of times that they, uh, you know, expel feces. And when that's increased, um, that shows anxiety. And so here, when the mice are eight months of age, so it's about five months after the therapy was started, you see that um, the ALS mice have an increased uh, you know, fecal boli count, but this actually is decreased significantly in the mice that are being treated with the drug. Again, these um, differences are not massive at this stage, but they are statistically significant. Um, so it appears that the drug may be decreasing the anxiety of the mice at this stage. Okay, so to summarize what we've done so far with the KD3010 preclinical trial is uh, we've established a safe and effective dose for KD3010 for the ALS study. Uh, co cohorts of mice were assigned with attention to NINDAS uh, guidelines for rigor and reproducibility. So, there's been a problem uh, in the past in terms of being able to reproduce results uh, from preclinical trials. So guidelines have been established to make sure, you know, that the, the that um, studies are done, you know, with the highest degree of, of rigor. And so we always sort of adhere to those guidelines, and which I, the details of which I, I won't bore you with, but it's important to sort of do this so that the study has the better has the best chance of being correct. Um, we performed some behavioral tests, as I showed you at the first post-treatment time point. There were some encouraging results, but it's very early and it's still quite preliminary. And we're going to follow the mice for the next five months and obtain the remaining behavioral testing results and also examine neuropathology readouts, which will be very objective at the conclusion of the study. And we're also going to be studying the TDP43 transgenic mice and that work has started, but we haven't really reached the first time point for behavioral testing. So in addition to studying KD3010, um, you know, there is another option that we could do and we've decided to do it. And that is there is another drug called T3D959 and it is a PPAR delta agonist that has some gamma activity and it has potent neuroprotective properties. So it's a PPAR delta activating compound, but it also activates PPAR gamma at 15 fold lower potency. So it sort of technically is a dual agonist, but it's you know, 90% uh, more than that, like 95% PPAR delta. Um, so the reason why we're studying this also is because T3D959 is approved for use in humans and it's progressed through an ascending dose trial in human volunteers. And there were no reports of serious adverse effects. And importantly, um, this drug is now being evaluated as a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. 
Uh, and again, the idea is that all these neurodegenerative diseases, as you heard in, in the video at the outset, share a number of features in common. Um, so the fact that this drug is being tested for Alzheimer's disease means perhaps it could also be um, repurposed for ALS as well. And the drug was found to be safe and effective in this initial phase 2A study. And um, you know, we're excited about this because we also feel if we achieve a successful outcome for the experimental studies testing P3D 959 as a therapy in ALS model mice, then we could you know, cross-purpose T3D 959 and get it into a clinical testing trial in ALS patients. And um, the, the individuals running T3D therapeutics, I have a good relationship with, and they're supportive uh, of moving this therapy into ALS if we can provide evidence that uh, the drug could be successful and they are manufacturing the drug in huge quantities. Um, so I view this as, as an opportunity. KD3010 is no longer being actively manufactured uh, as a drug to be used in humans, so we'd have to manufacture it uh, afresh, which of course we could do. Um, but I just thought that this was another opportunity that we should explore. Um, and so uh, you're going to hear a similar sort of set of uh, results, a similar story. First, we do optimization work. And in this case, again, we use, we use different um, you know, concentrations, 50 milligrams per kilogram, 70 milligrams, 90 milligrams per kilogram. We were looking for changes in body weight to see if there was uh, how things were you know, being tolerated. Um, and we also did these pharmacodynamic studies where we treat the mice for a week and then we dissect out their brain and spinal cords. We isolate RNA and we measure the gene expression for genes that are targeted by PPAR delta and we're looking for increases. And we see that both with 50, 70, and 90 milligrams that you see, you know, increases in the expression of the target genes for the most part. In, the, in this one case, we didn't see it um, for this PDK, PDK4, but you know, um, for the most part, this worked really well. Um, and uh, in the spinal cord, a similar pattern. Yeah, PDK4 doesn't seem to be as responsive, but the other two genes are. So to us, that was um, sufficiently compelling you know, that we felt that this was engaging with target you know, in the central nervous system and we could move forward. So um, what we observed is that, you know, um, um, at 90 milligrams per kilogram, it was a little bit too high. We started to see some problems and irritation. So we decided to go with 70 milligrams per kilogram as the safe and effective dose, um, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, again, we had seen some issues. So that's at 70. Uh, so then we decided that we would go down to 50 milligrams per kilogram because we saw, again, some, some things in the mice that, were unusual. And so what we're doing is, um, uh, you know, uh, we also did an experiment where we stopped the drug and we, for three weeks, and we saw that the PPAR Delta dar target stayed up um, at 50 milligrams. So we felt that um, we could go every other day delivery, we could do 50 milligrams per kilogram. And so that's what we decided to do with T3D 959. Okay. Um, in terms of body weight at this dosage, we haven't really seen a problem. The mice gain weight um, comparably. Um, you know, the drug treatment females actually weigh more than the controls, whereas it's the opposite for the males. But the, you see that variation sometimes. But the important thing is that they're gaining weight together on this curve, and that's very normal. Um, so again, what we did was the rotating rod test. This is three months post-treatment. We didn't see really any difference. And at six months post-treatment, we didn't see any difference either in terms of uh, motor coordination. This is a coordination task. And then we started to look at grip strength. And here, um, you know, again, we're looking to see if there's any difference. There's really you know, uh, I mean, it seems like there's a little uh, difference here in terms of strength where the mice, um, the ALS mice are a little bit stronger, but it's, you know, nothing, it's again very early, so it's hard to know, you know, what that, that means, but really in, in just the male mice, but not in the female mice, any difference. And grip strength at the later time point, 
Um, we also started to you know, see, we started to see some differences where the mice were becoming weaker, the females more so than the males, and uh, maybe a slight, a slight difference here, but not really statistically significant. So no really effect uh, at this point is what our conclusion is. Now, in terms of um, the, uh, the neurological phenotype, um, we were looking to see if there was a difference in terms of the score going down. And it looks like that there is a significantly reduced signs of neurological disease because the scores are lower in the males and the females. And when we broke it out between the males and the females, we saw that the effect was mostly due to the males. So the males are responding more so than the females. But if you put the whole group of mice together, you still see a statistically significant improvement in the neurological phenotyping screen. Um, and at six months, uh, that unfortunately did not persist. You know, we basically see that things look very similar. And now in terms of open field, uh, what we saw was um, we did see a difference. We saw increased hyperactivity in the ALS mice. And we saw that there was a trend toward reduced hyperactivity in the mice that were receiving T3D959, as I think you can appreciate here, there's a slight reduction and the group, you know, is sort of at a lower, at lower distance travel. Um, and then uh, we also have started to study the TD, TDP43 transgenic mice. Um, again, here we're showing you the weights, that the weights are very normal. So the drug is not causing any side effects. Um, here we saw a trend toward improved motor function on the rotor rod, uh, where the male mice could stay on the rod longer, but not the female mice. Um, so that's why the whole group together is not significant. And um, at four months, it, again, it, there was no change. So our conclusion is probably really no effect on motor coordination yet. Um, and then we also did grip strength. We didn't see any change in grip strength, unfortunately. Um, at the two and four month post initiation of treatment time points. And then we also did this neurological screening exam. And here we saw results that were, uh, uh, again, you know, encouraging um, uh, where we saw, uh, but in this case, it was interesting, the female mice responded more so than the male mice and their results were statistically significant. Uh, but I think you can see in the whole group together that there's a trend. So there was a trend for the male mice, significant improvement for the female mice. And when you put all the mice together, you see a trend toward improvement. Um, that is not statistically significant, but these are early time points. And then unfortunately at four months, you know, that um, did not persist. Um, so, you know, it uh, didn't hold up so far. So to summarize the T3D959 preclinical trial, we established a safe and effective dose. We again assigned cohorts with attention to the guidelines for rigor and reproducibility. We did behavioral testing. We saw some encouraging results, but only at the initial time point and that hasn't persisted thus far. And we're gonna follow the mice for the next three to five months and obtain the remaining behavioral testing results and examine the neuropathology readouts at the conclusion of the study. So, I mean, at this point, you know, what I would say is that, um, you know, the study is still very early on and the mice, you know, their disease progression is slow. So at the, at the terminal time points, at the terminal time point is the greatest uh, behavioral ab abnormalities so there we'll have the largest dynamic range to see a difference. So I think at this point, we just can't say uh, what's going to happen. It's too early. Uh, we obviously haven't seen, you know, uh, a significant improvement at this early stage, but that doesn't rule out that, um, you know, uh, by the time we reach the conclusion of the study, we won't see something. And the neuropathology that we do will be very objective and it will speak to you know, what's going on in terms of um, the disease process uh, and that information together with the behavioral data will allow us to conclude whether the drugs are having an effect or not. So that's the update at this point. So it's still very much a work in progress and um, too early really to draw any final conclusions. So 
if that wasn't too boring and I didn't put you to sleep uh, <laughs> and you have any questions, I'd be free to, uh, I'd be happy to, to try and answer them. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Lizpada. That was that was really interesting. Um, I'll wait for folks to chime in with any questions that they have, or if they want to put them in the chat. Um, and maybe while people are thinking of things, I can I can ask one question. I'm curious if you could tell us just a little more about the the neurological phenotyping test that you do, and like what is that what is that measuring, and and um, how do you interpret the fact that you're seeing like an improvement in early early time points and then and then later not it doesn't persist so the neurological phenotyping task is something that we developed like about i don't know 13 years ago we published it in the journal of visualized experimentation it's, be, it's become very popular in fact it was embarrassed it's one of my most highly cited papers um, anyway um, uh, it's a very simple task and it involves like these four components. So we put the mice on the ledge of the cage and we see if they can balance there, if they're on study. And, you know, zero means they do perfectly fine. One is they have a minor problem. Two, they have a moderate problem. Three, they have a severe problem. Clasping is where we hold the mice by the tails. And there's an interesting reflex in mice that if they're normal, they'll splay their like limbs out. But if they have neurological disease, they'll pull them in and clasp. Again, we rate that on a scale of zero to three. And then we have a gait test where we just basically take the mice out and we put them you know, out and we let them walk um, you know, on a flat surface and we observe if their gait is normal or if it's you know, somehow you know, um, abnormal, if they're you know, limping, if you will. Um, and then finally, kyphosis is we just take the mice out and we stare at their backs and see if they have like you know, a bowing because you need muscular strength to maintain your spinal column, you know, flat, um, you know, well, with a nice sort of level curvature and you see the spinal cord bow up if there's muscle weakness. So that's something that we do. Um, we call that the composite neurological screening test. And, you know, the, the scores that we, you may notice the scores that we have are only in like the, you know, two to four range or, you know, zero to four range. Uh, you know, zero to two really is, is hardly anything worth, um, you know, it's not very abnormal. So we're talking about really, these mice are not sick yet. I mean, they are very mildly affected still. This is a, the mouse models progress slowly um, that we're using. Um, that's because the models are intended to be more physiologically relevant. There are more aggressive models where the mice become sick and they die like in weeks. But the way that that occurs does not follow the pathological mechanisms that um, occur in human patients. So some people use those mice and you can get some readout of you know, TDP43 pathology, but it's the pathology that is not as relevant to what goes on in human patients. So we've opted for models where you know, the, the disease process progresses more slowly and because we feel that's gonna be more predictive of reality. Um, but the problem is because it moves really slowly, we're talking about differences that are minuscule. So when we saw that improvement, it was a minuscule improvement, but because we have so many mice enrolled in the study for power, it comes up as significant. So the fact that it went away at the later time point you know, it wasn't shocking to us because, you know, these are very small incremental changes that we're seeing. However, at the terminal time points, you know, the, the abnormality will be much larger. And if there's an improvement, it'll be much more detectable and much more meaningful. So, you know, I'm giving you the report now, but it's sort of like, um, I don't know if you're a baseball fan or a football fan, it's like trying to predict you know, at the end of the first quarter, you know, who's going to win the game. Sometimes you can do that, right? <laughs> you know, because the results are already so lopsided, but often you can't. So we're really just still, you know, ending the first quarter of this study. We have three quarters to go. And um, when we come to the conclusion, you know, then we'll have, um, we'll have an answer in one way or the other. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Lisa put a question in the chat. Okay. Hi. 
Chris, how long did my spend in the open area behavioral test? Secondly, when comparing body mass changes between the glycine buffer and treatment group were effects of torpor taken into account. And thank you for doing this great research. Um, yeah, um, so by Chris, I think she means Al. Um, but anyway, um, so um, yeah, so how long did my spend open area? Uh, so yeah, that's something that, um, you know, we haven't like sort of looked at yet. Um, we decided we would look for more on the hyperactivity just because that was, but you're right, that is another way to monitor anxiety. And that's something that we could do, but we know that's okay to worry about. Um, people have called me worse things. Um, so um, uh, yeah, so, so we haven't looked at that specific readout because our sense from the field is, is less um, powerful. Um, but we could do that. Um, and when comparing body mass changes um, or effects of torpor take into account, yes, we always are looking to see if there's anything out of the ordinary. And if that were to occur, we would become concerned and be like, okay, this dose is too aggressive. And then we would pull back. Um, you know, I always try and go to the highest doses possible, you know, because that's, because then we see if the drug works, but we, we definitely don't want to, you know, cause the mice um, side effects. So, but we look for that as well. I feel like the open field test might lose its 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 um, efficacy and as a measure of anxiety as disease progresses, though. Um, so, like, I like the I like the use of the of the fecal bolus test, which yeah. It's, <laughs> It's very objective, um, you know. Uh, but again, we, we we drove the decision based upon the literature, where it's been reported, you know, by another group as uh, uh, as a reliable metric, um, you know. So, I mean, well, you know, because you have some experience from being a researcher, there's dozens of tests we could do, and you know, we can't do all of them. It's just not logistically feasible, um, you know. Uh, uh, you know, you, you, not just even if we had an army of people to do the testing, the mice become, you know, tired. You can't do multiple tests all at once. It's just too much for the mice to take. So we try to sort of, you know, prioritize the tests that we think are, are best based upon the experience of characterizing the mice that the field has done. Um, and that's how we choose these tests. Now, if people have other questions, of anything else going on in, in the ALS field that they want to ask, I'm more than happy to entertain them. Um, or anything else going on, you know. Uh, um, amazing, an amazing opportunity to ask all of your ALS research questions. <laughs> Final question: Are there any uh, intern research assistants? roles in your lab oh, well um uh, we always um uh, we're always looking for good people we have a lot of um you know um undergraduate students who are doing internships in the lab um yeah so i uh, uh i don't know if you want to move to southern california or not but um it's not a horrible thing especially this time of year right um but um, no, uh, uh, if someone's interested in joining us, I'm always happy to entertain their, uh, their application. Um, we don't have, we're not advertising for a paid position right now, but we could be in the future. Um, and, uh, you know, um, so yeah, we have volunteer positions and sometimes we start people out in a volunteer position and if things go well, then we elevate them to a paid position. So the answer is, Yes, we have opportunities. Do we have um, paid openings? Right now we don't, but we could in the future. I'll ask one more question if no one else is, um, is, is uh, ready to ask anything. Um, I guess, and, and I know that it's really early to say these are very early time points, but at any time you see these sorts of differences in males and females, I wonder if there is an intersect, like what is known about the PPARs and how they intersect or don't with estrogen receptor signaling or anything that, that might explain a, a sex difference. Okay. 
Well, no, that's a really perceptive question because uh, estrogen receptor is, is in the same you know, family of nuclear receptors. Um, we're pretty confident that um, you know, there's no cross activation of estrogen receptor or androgen receptor you know, in the case of males. Uh, you know, the, this PPAR delta agonist is, is incredibly selective and we worry about selectivity within the PPARs um, but that's something that even now, you know, we, well, as I pointed out for T3D959, there's a little cross-reactivity to gamma, which we think could be beneficial because people are gamma is expressed in microglia. Um, but um, no, the reason, so we don't, so we don't think there's a pharmacological answer, you know, based upon the therapy that we're delivering specifically, but um, there are differences in terms of, um, you know, metabolic pathways in males and females that these, uh, you know, that this drug agonization could be affecting that would play out different differentially in the male uh, and the female sort of um, brains. So that's, you know, so, th so there's definitely differences in male and female physiology in the brain. And this could somehow be, you know, uh, these results could be reflective of that. Um, we don't know the answer to that, though. Okay, so. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, we can, um, we can close there. Please feel free to send questions that you that might come to you later to me, and I can, I can loop you in with Dr. Lasbada, but please join me in thanking him. This was, this was great. I really appreciate the time that you put into uh, the update that you sent by email and, and this presentation. And um, as I mentioned, we'll record it and post it uh, on our website so that anyone who wasn't able to join in real time can, can view it later. And we look forward to updates uh, next year. Yeah, we're really hoping that by the summer, you know, we'll have um, very definitive answers. We're keeping our fingers crossed that, you know, we see positive results because these are drugs that you know, are proof for use in humans. That's the rationale for doing it. Um, but um, unfortunately, at this point, you know, it's just too early. Um, and we certainly appreciate, you know, the support of IMALS and our other funders. And um, we'll know soon. Um, and I'll look forward to giving another presentation at that time. Great. We'll welcome you back. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. Have a great evening. Okay, well, everyone, take care.